your structural drawings are largely done in pencil. Your pictorial drawings are done with charcoal. Why those two different types of drawing tools? The graphite is a very delicate medium. It can give you extremely quiet lines. You build the form slowly like you would in the structural drawing. The charcoal is more like caveman stuff, <laughs> cavewoman. Uh, where you you um, cover the sheet with charcoal and then you erase out. What that does is it's much more kind of a fluid, painterly way of using the material. So sometimes I want to be very precise and I want to understand my subject matter. You're really matching your intent with the material. Yeah. It evolves over time. Most of what happens with technique is that you have a certain feeling that you want to get. You try this, you try that. This has been kind of the thing that winnowed down for me, thinking about what's the best tool to understand the thing that I'm trying to, to understand. You have this like military operation <laughs> of sharpening. Is this just trial and error? Definitely. And I've learned stuff from people who are really good at this. Believe it or not, what I've got is kind of crude compared to people who really know what they're doing. The atelier schools are amazing in their discipline about, around tools. So I've learned a lot about sharpening pencils and thinking about uh, the precision of the tool basically over time. So the whole reason that we want a pencil sharpened in this manner is so that we can get a really long, tapered point. You have a lot more control over how the line goes down and how it moves in space than if you have a very short bit of, of lead showing at the end. You can also sharpen it to a really like needle sharp point, which is, this is okay, but believe it or not, I've seen ones that are just, would blow your mind. I mean, that looks like a good murder weapon, right? <laughs> so I've got this knife, which is one of those retractable exacto type knives and you just want to carefully carve out this is going to be a little messy but why does it have to be so long because couldn't you just sharpen just the sharpest part is there a reason why it's like yeah, that because it, when you hold it and when you're making lines you have much more control over a long point if this were a short point it would be really hard for me to get this level of deep control plus you're going to be using the side and the tip you can customize how much point you want. And then you can keep it very, very sharp mm -hmm. by using sandpaper. No slip grip, 3M, pro grade, 220. Dry, wet, so you can use it for both. The grit is just enough that it doesn't take off too much, and it's not so smooth that it clogs. So it's, it. oh, it's actually coarser than yeah, I it's pretty thought. coarse. All right, so it's, it's not really super coarse. fine. No. Okay. Because the super fine stuff will clog quite easily with, uh, with the graphite. So I'm gonna carefully hold it flat. Okay, you don't wanna tip it up this way, you wanna hold it flat, and you're going to just turn it in your hand. So you can see I'm rolling it a little bit. Wait, you're like I'm rolling rotating it? Like this. it? Oh, okay, all right. Rotating it like that while I go back and forth. So you just wanna maintain that it's flat. People will do this and it won't work as well. You wanna keep it flat, and what happens is the entire length of the lead will become sharp. Does it matter how hard the pencil is that you're sharpening? Like, can you not do that with a 6B because it's too soft? You could do it. It would just clog faster, and it would be a little bit more greasy. Is this 4B? What is this This one? is a 2B. Okay. Uh, I don't use anything even darker than a 2B, so I couldn't even tell you what, what would happen, but I'm assuming you could certainly do it. You've got too much powder here, you just wanna dump it off. Right, you're the total opposite than me. I think 2B is the hardest <laughs> that I use. I'm like 9B, 8B. Oh, Working with like very tiny increments of space and being conscious of how light or dark the mark is, it's all about that space. And if it's too dark, I'm like locked out. It's one of those strange touch issues that I think is a temperament and maybe a your nervous system, how, how it's built. I just am feeling a little bit like a Neanderthal right now when I watch you sharpen Nothing these tools. Nothing wrong with Neanderthals. <laughs> They're survivors, right? The subject that I have is so outrageously sensitive that my tools have become more and more so. 
I also use mechanical pencils. They are a longer lid, obviously you can have them come out. Yikes! Go in. That was really scary looking. <laughs> They're a little heavier in your hand than a, than a wooden pencil. Does that get in the way? It can be a little bit less, just a little bit less comfortable. But you also have this little gizzy, which is a, a sharpener. This is a shorter point. What did you just do? Well, what I did was I took the lid and I put it in this hole. Uh huh. Okay, and then I opened it up. And you press it in? And that gives you the exact length that's gonna work in here. Oh, because if it's too long, yeah, it won't. If it's won't. too long, it won't sharpen over. Okay. Okay, so then you spin it like that. And when you take it out, you can dip it in that little thing, which takes wait, wait. off. What, what's, <laughs> what is this? It's a little pad that, I don't always use it, but you can stick the lead in there and it will pull off the dust. I mean, this is for like architects. This is for people really? who really know what the hell they're doing, you know? That um, little amount of dust matters? Yeah, it would matter because it would come off on your, on your paper. What I'm thinking about is this tiny little bit of increments of space. If there was a big hunk of graphite there, it would like explode my world. Wow. I know. <laughs> With the mechanical pencil, when you press this, yeah. it, it, it's a retractable thing. So when I press on the back here, it can, you know, I can. Okay. And then that loosens the that lead. Loosens it you can make it longer or shorter to sharpen it. Mm. Okay, if I just did this and I stuck it in there, it would, it would break. Oh, right? okay. So this gives me the exact. And I so you press up. and then you push down. Right. And then you get. And now that's, that's the correct the length that okay. I need. We have a kneaded eraser which is a kind of a gummy, rubbery thing. It's a good um, for stress relieving. You know, I do it all the time. I do too. When I'm teaching, <laughs> I'm like, mm, wait a minute. What it does is it's a self-cleaning kind of thing. Erase this, and you get a little bit of schmutz on there. You can just pull it and clean it. You can also rip it into little pieces, and you can make a much more fine point. You can sculpt your eraser, basically. Yeah. Well, how would you know that the kneaded eraser is, okay, it's done, I gotta go get a new one. Like, what for it you is the signal? It looks pretty gross, yeah. When it's really black and it doesn't stretch, it's like, ooh. Uh, and you wanna be careful not to get any grease in there, because then that will change your, the ability for you to, uh, to erase. And then there are two different types of erasers that are retractable. This is a Mars Stadlator, I think I pronounced that correctly. You basically can go in and out with this mechanism. They have handles and they have refills that you can push in and out. I use uh, a razor blade to cut them like that so I can get a really good point. And if I'm, I'm erasing the inside of a petal and it's a millimeter, I mean, it's tiny, uh, and I want a little bit of light to happen there, I need a very precise tool. This can be quite precise. Well, also, the knee eraser is so floppy. This is much more stiff, so yeah. you can probably get a harsher, more yes. blunt stroke. Exactly. So I have a number of different graphite grades. HB, it's pretty thick, and I go all the way up to like a 5H, and the 5H would be the first lines that I put down. It holds me back. The harder graphite forces me to have a really light touch because not a lot comes off. If I have a very thick charcoal, a lot comes off even with a light touch. That's all kind of calibrated in terms of touch. For me. I would want to get around, oops, get around the structure using lines like this. And those lines are probably going to disappear eventually. I'll erase them or they'll get pulled into the drawing as a whole. But I don't want too much graphite coming off the paper at the beginning. As I continue and I want a darker line, like I have this, which is probably my darkest pencil, and you can really get a beautiful silvery dark with that. For the hardest pencils, do you find that you have to draw light? Because if you draw harshly, you'll actually carve marks yes, carve. into the paper. Right, you'll carve marks in the paper, you break your tip. So it forces you to, to be light. I don't want to press down hard, but at a normal pressure, it's going to come out very, very light. And that's very important to me. I'm a big paper nerd. I feel like a wonderful way to spend a day would be to go to an art store and feel up all the paper. <laughs> Only for people like us. The paper I use is very important. It's a very delicate, thin paper called Angra, made by Fabriano. Lightweight, and it also has these small, very 
tiny little lines. It's called LAID, L-A-I-D. The sensitivity of the paper is really critical. It slows my hand down a little bit, so you get that sensitive touch. When I use charcoal, it instantly looks like space. Is this paper hard to find? Probably find it with some of the bigger manufacturers. Do you tear the paper mm -hmm. as opposed to cutting it with a pair of scissors? Why are you yeah. doing that? It gives you a deckled edge. If I were doing a drawing and I were going to exhibit it, I would always want to have this type of an edge. I think it's more beautiful and there's probably a real reason. That's all you do? You just yeah. fold it just and fold that's it? it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The charcoal tools are pretty specific. Powdered charcoal. But wait, is this yeah. what you're using? Powdered charcoal. Okay, so you buy yeah. it in a jar. Stuff that you just kind of like scrapings from your own drawings. It can actually be a little too uneven. I can sprinkle it on and then I can... Whoa. Yeah. I tend to tone the paper fairly lightly. I have a little bit of charcoal there and I can just erase through it to get my lights. It's so clean. Yeah, it's amazing. Is yeah. that the paper? The paper is so delicate that it holds the charcoal in a very specific way. I am a big fan of uh, Surratt, Georges Surratt's drawings. Oh, love his drawings. Oh my God, so amazing. So good. So amazing. He used Conti crayon, which is a different material, but the paper had everything to do with how you saw those little bits of, of uh, atmosphere. It's very much the same thing for me here, that I'm trying to feel the air of the paper. I've also noticed that when I work with students, Half the time, their drawing problems are because they have the wrong paper. Yeah. I have sure. students that are trying yeah. to do charcoal drawings on newsprint. Oh, yeah. No. You can actually take the sponge. But wait, what kind of sponge is okay, that? Okay, it's, it's called uh, Pan Pastel is the company that makes, they make pastels, they make these sponges, and they make these little applicators. And it's a really high-density foam. Uh, it's not really like a makeup sponge. It's, it's more oh, dense. it's sort of hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's dense. But wait, you get that at an art supply yes. store. Mm -hmm. Pan Pastel. I can use the Pan Pastel, the little um, gizzy here, and I can actually draw with it. I can move, it, move the charcoal around. But wait, where did you get that little spongy tip thing? That, this comes with the whole Pan Pastel. Oh, it's like a big kit. Uh, it's, it's a kit and they have replacement items. So this is a little sponge that comes on, on and off. So if it gets too dirty, you take it off and put a new one on. And then you can actually dip the the sponge into the charcoal and draw with it. So oh, it's really that. satisfying. I also will draw with the stump, put the charcoal right in the powdered charcoal and just literally draw with the stump. So you don't ever draw directly I with do. the charcoal? I do. I use sharpened charcoal. These are nitrum, N-I-T-R-A-M, different grades of charcoal. And I sharpen them like I sharpen the pencils so that you can get a very fine point if you want one. Is that vine charcoal? No, it's a little bit, it's not terribly compressed, but it's a little bit more compressed than vine, less powdery, and there are different grades of hardness here. But wait, what are the colors? Green one is B, orange one is HB, and the blue one is H. This is the hardest one, uh, then this is a little bit uh, softer and softer still. But wait, is Nitrum the brand yep. or is Nitrum it the type? Charcoal. Nitrum charcoal, okay. is the brand. Vine charcoal, where I can make a big, a big bunch of dust on there. But I tend to like to rub it in and get like a more fine, even tone. With and toilet paper. Toilet paper. High tech. <laughs> Compressed charcoal sticks. This is a medium. You have a hard, a medium. I can really get very seriously tiny and very, very controlled lines that are darker and less powdery. And this is the same concept with the pencils, that because it's long, you can just be very more, delicate. Yeah, very, the touch is very light. The sensitivity is just profound. It's just all about control. It's all about control. <laughs> Ooh, control me. I always thought being delicate with drawing was in my hand, but now you're telling me that it's actually a lot of that is in the tool that the tool assists your hand to become more delicate. Oh, definitely. So the things that are harder are gonna slow your hand down. Is there a particular brand you like for vine charcoal? Yeah, I like Winsor Newton. It's uh, really consistent. If I put a lot of charcoal on, I don't necessarily want all of that linear quality. The stump will just take that off and create much more of a softer kind of tonality that doesn't have a lot of ridges. Do you ever think about the direction 
I mean, I'm not right now, but if I were, yeah, I'd be very careful about direction because that, of course, is how you build form. You can also draw with the stump, which I do quite a bit of. I can make marks with the charcoal. I can even get more on the tip uh, and really draw with it. Quite often, you you know, you want to move the charcoal around in, in some different way, and I'll I'll brush things off. I tend to take edges off a lot. I'll mm. put the, put a lot on and then take stuff off. And you can use little ones as well. What do the little ones do that the fan brush doesn't do? It's just more control. <laughs> this is the theme here. <laughs> The difference between something this thick and something that thick is really important. Mm -hmm. It seems insane, but really, it, it really matters. What about fixative? Do you mm -hmm. ever put fixative on afterwards? or I do at the end. I don't do much with fixing it and then working over. Well, does it ever bother you, though, that the fixative does make the drawing a little bit darker? Because it's not quite the same no, after. it isn't quite the same. I, you know, I guess I don't use it that much. Mm -hmm. I probably should. I'm going to use the same exact principle that I did before, and I'm going to put it down flat, and I'm going to turn it. You're rotating it around? Uh-huh. Rotating, mm -hmm. rotating it and turning it at the same time. And remember, you're not doing this. You're keeping it flat. So this uh, takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you don't use the knife at all? Not on the charcoal. Oh, it's just the sandpaper. Oh, yeah, just the sandpaper. Oh, I thought you were going to go in and... No, 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 no. So here's my knife again, and I'm going to sharpen this the same way. If you drop these on the ground, you will most likely have a breakage on the interior. So try not to drop them, because then when you do this, they'll just crack. I don't know. I always break them. Do you? <laughs> They're yeah. always falling apart. I don't know how you're doing such a long yeah. stroke and not yeah. breaking it. I've broken about 2,000 of them. That's well, I mean, you're making it look so easy, yeah. but I would not be able to do that. <laughs> if you broke 1,000 of them, you would. That's true. Yeah. So I guess you pretty much have to sit right next to a trash can for all yes. this. Yes. <laughs> because I notice you have one, like, right to your right, and you can yeah. just go in there. It's really easy to snap these if you put pressure on this mm. way, so you really have to make a point to keep it flat. I think so much of art is practice. Don't you think? And doing it wrong. Doing it wrong a million times. I would say I have to do at least two or three paintings wrong to, to know what I want to do. I think students don't like to hear that. You're making mistakes, quote unquote mistakes, but you're really not. You're training your body to understand what to do in space. I understand the impulse because who doesn't want to make a good drawing? Sure, of, course. of course you do. Yeah. but. You can't always do it that way, no, no, no. or you can be delusional and tell yourself they're all good, but that doesn't really work. You, you do a lot of it, and then you, you're doing it so much that out of that comes products. For me, charcoal pencil, it's like, yep, you're married now. <laughs> There's exactly. no flexibility. No divorce. <laughs> nope, not an option. No, 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 no. And then you wipe it off to make sure you get all that dust off, because that'll, that'll get on the paper, too really fine. Yeah. It looks like pencil, doesn't it? Yeah. The difference between the two in terms of touch, so I'm going to just very gently touch. Wait, is that hard? The, hard one. the hardest one. How much darkness do you want to have down there? How soon? If I have too much down there to begin with, I'm lost already. Do you see? So your delicate drawing approach is somewhat about flexibility, like leaving your options open? Oh, yeah. The thing about the chamois cloth is that it will take off the charcoal in a big way. The chamois will really take it all off. That's when you just want to get you, rid of it. Yeah. You can use it very carefully if you want to, but I find I can do better with an eraser. You always have to do this with the chamois, which is another thing. Oh, are you cleaning up the stuff? Yeah, it's like little schmutz comes off with this thing. Schmutz anyway. really bothers you, doesn't it? Schmutz, I'm telling you. <laughs> you can draw in a really kind of a fine way, get very little tiny bits of atmosphere going. What about this like crappy uh, little yeah. eraser? Right. <laughs> what does that eraser do for you? It's an eraser. You know, I might use it. But these aren't as high quality. They tend to shred a little bit more. A lot of contemporary notions about flowers sort of err on the side of pretty, not serious, a sexist, feminine kind of idea. And I was leery about mm -hmm. that. But it became clear about five years ago that it was creeping up, and it was something I couldn't really ignore. 
another painter, known her for many years, 20 years. She knows my work very well. She said, something's happening in these flowers and you should pay attention to it. And I thought, oh God, no, no, no. not roses, please. And she said, no, just, just do it for a year. I started working from them and it, it just kept spiraling into more and more ideas. They speak for me and they speak to me at the same time. I can turn this rose in and out of the light. And when I do, it creates a different structure visually. It also creates a different kind of emotional content. If I have a rose facing the light, that's a very different feeling than if I have it facing down and away from the light. And then I have this little gizzy, which my husband made. I can insert the rose here, and then I can move it in the light. I can move this wire, because it's very bendable, and the flower is in a little flask of water. The ones that you get from the florist are very stiff. So we have to kind of play with them a little bit to make them feel more alive. You can even turn this almost completely upside down, which gives us the advantage of having a pendant sense of weight. The light is critical. How you pose the flower is critical. And I think a lot of people don't spend time thinking about those things, and they end up sort of just jumping into it, and you're, gonna, you're not going to have the same kind of an emotional connection. So much of what I do relies on, on touch. I'm trying to get the visuals, but I'm trying to literally feel it in my hands when I'm painting it. How this moves that way is important for how the whole thing feels in space. I'm trying to sort of orient so that I know where the sharpest parts of the petals are. We turn it this way, that way, but also we can turn it this way. It's almost like if you had the figure, and the figure were inclining its head to the left or the right, and you would say, just move a little bit more to the left, all of a sudden it, it would be correct. The movement of the petals, like this little sharp thing right here, those sharp things are important. It's also literally how it feels in your hands. I'm trying to get my body to respond the way that the flower actually feels in space as a form. All of the little movements are key, and what the light reveals is also key. So if I turn it away from the light, like this, then this whole side of the rose right here is very, very prominent. So it's got to come forward, whereas this is really quiet back here. You're exploring. You're not doing something you know how to do. You're having an, an adventure every time. I always say to my students, pretend you're like from Mars. Like you just came down from Mars, you have no idea what you're looking at, and you're like, what the hell is that? You know, how do I, how, what is that anyway? How is it formed? How do, I, how do I understand it? To see it new every time is the, really the only reason to paint it. I would never want to make a painting that I already knew how to do. The setup is 50% of, of what the painting is. I'll do this for like two hours before I even paint. Once you get painting, then of course all other, lots of other things happen that are interesting and fun and experimental. I have to fall in love with the light. I have to be just like, oh, that is just stunning. And if I feel that, hopefully the viewer feels that too. The light tells the story. If the light comes in and it washes in a certain way, it creates an emotional drama. All of the things that I do with the flowers has to do with controlling light. We respond to the complexity of natural light. You get a sense that the whole space is being informed. The form in the space it has much bigger range. If you think of a spotlight, it's giving you much clearer, in some ways, shadows. Natural light is the middle tones are more pronounced. So that's where all the color happens. Seeing the form is huge. I want to evoke the presence of the form. So being able to see the form and feel it in space, is, you can't do it without it. The sculptural quality, how the form exists in a certain kind of light, is really the only way I can translate the presence. It sort of washes and it, it, it drains. So if it hits one petal here, it'll drain off in the shadow, and then it'll hit again and then drain off again. I know a lot of people don't want to work with natural light because it's not very reliable. How do you make sure that you have the right setup? I think I'm very lucky to have this space that I have. It's very big. The windows are really tall. And the light is consistent 
pretty much all day long. It's very bright in the morning, kind of bounces around, but after a certain point, it, it just quiets down. It'll last a long time, even in the winter. I couldn't do what I do without natural light. And when I teach, it's a little difficult because I usually have to have artificial light. And even doing a demo from artificial light is difficult for me because I have a hard time connecting emotion. How the light works, how it f comes in through a certain orientation, it informs the whole emotional experience. I know some of your compositions are single roses, but you do have a lot that are multi-figure compositions. So do you always start with one rose and add on, or do you start with three all at once? Uh, I do lots of different things. I mean, it just kind of depends on the flow of the creative day. What I can do is add a second flower and put them together and see how they feel as a unit. Quite often you want some scale shift. So you'll have a, a large one and a small one. One of the things that happens when you have two that are different scales, you immediately have a, I know this sounds weird, but a maternal, you know, sort of like a child and a parent. Once you have two, you have a relationship going. And I could actually make multiple stands and then have a whole group of them. Do you think about the weight of the individual roses, one being heavier, one being lighter oh, than another to yeah. help you compose? Absolutely. The sense of kinetics is really important in my painting. How do things rise? How do they fall? Are they heavy? Are they light? Hugely important because what you're dealing with is a form that has presence in space as, a, as something physical. If I have this facing down, not only is it an emotional position, maybe it feels more minor key or more recessive or whatever, but it's also heavier. This one being lighter and more delicate, facing upward is gonna have a completely different feeling to it. You have one figure moving down, you think of Giotto, Death of St. Francis. The movement of the, of the monks as they get closer to the figure of Francis and all of that staggered movement is so much a part of the content, you know, and you feel it as they, as they move down. Very much like that. So I'm always thinking about great painting too and what, you know, what's come before me in terms of great painting in terms of content. So when we think about these hybrid tea, the ones that you get from the florist, they're like very stiff models. You know, these are like models that are kind of not so, not so fluent. The ones from the garden are like acrobats. It's like having an acrobat in your studio and you can like ask them to do anything and they can do it. If I have two flowers that span pretty far in terms of hue, like this one goes from yellow red, right? Yellow red to yellow, and this one goes to red to red violet. So that's a really big span of color. Okay, so if they're that far apart, they're gonna individuate more. If I have a bunch of different colors, that means I'm dealing with a bunch of different people. You're thinking in color at the same time that you're thinking in form and light. Pretty much every single little thing you could imagine is considered, which I didn't really realize until I started teaching this stuff. <laughs> I think looking at great art, the ideas, the, the visual reality of that is in the back of my brain somewhere. So when I actually pose these, I'm thinking about Degas, I'm thinking about Chardin, I'm thinking about Vermeer, whoever is with me that day. Right now, if I look at these two, they hit each other right here. So they have this really beautiful touch sensation. If I pull them apart very slightly, like that, then the distance between them becomes important. Whether or not they're touching becomes important. All these little movements are critical to the content. What's kind of nice about this stem is it's got a little bit of a curve right here. As I turn this flower away from me, the face of the flower is in the shadow. Then if this one is in the light, and this one is in the shadow, we're saying something right there. The turning of these things in the light as they relate to each other is, is really like the whole thing. It's beautiful from the, from the front and the side, but also from the back. I mean, if we look at how graceful that is as it moves in, the little sepal things move that way. So you've got this beautiful light hitting the back of the flower. With the flowers that you touch them, yeah. which I think is strange. You think you would just set them up and yeah, paint, but you were actually pulling them apart a little yeah. bit. Why are you doing that? If you open them up, you can think of them as sculptures. As they pose in the light, 
they have a certain kind of rhythm and, and movement to them. So if something looks too stiff, I'll just kind of pull it open. And I'm always touching them. Everything really is about touch. To touch them, it's sort of like I feel, how thick is that pedal? How does it move? I get yelled at at the uh, garden centers, like, don't pat the flowers, you know? <laughs> yeah. When I draw, I'm able to get to know my subject. And I'm also able to decide which ideas are going to work and which aren't. So I'll do a lot of drawings, but maybe only one or two will survive. So it's a practice. The, the drawing is a habit, and out of that habit, some things will come to fruition. The two different types of drawings that I do are more, the more analytical ones and the more pictorial ones. What's the difference between the structural drawings versus the pictorial ones? The structural drawings are more about line. They have a kind of linear, web-like quality to them. So I'm trying to look through the form, into the form. Pictorial drawings are more about painting. How will this look on a two-dimensional surface? Structural drawings are more like working drawings, like blueprints almost. I'm trying to get to know the, how the thing is built. Some of them are long and pointed. Uh, some reflex, they go backwards. They arc in a certain way. Some are like, almost like discs with very few petals. It's like looking at different people. It's almost like you're trying to figure out the anatomy of each specific rose. The more I work with the this, this subject, the more I realize this is just my figurative training with a different life form. What I'm doing is I'm laying out bones of the space where the flower is going to live. You're coming in from a very large overall mass. The front face of the flower is relatively straight, and that's back here. The major division of light and dark is right about here. And I have to squint a lot. They're like little tiny bits of architecture that are so complicated. You need to know them before you jump in. I've been studying classical drawing for only maybe eight years or so, and it makes a big, big difference. Most of what I'm looking for is the big look, the big picture. And that takes a certain kind of editing and squinting and amassing. And that's what, when you work this way, it, it forces you to see that way. Well, the difference is that you're not drawing petal by petal. You're really conceptualizing the entire structure. I am, but I'm seeing it too. I'm not just thinking about it. I'm actually squinting and I'm looking for where the division is. You squint a lot when you draw? All the time. Constantly, because if it's about light, then I want, to see the, I want to see the big chunks of light, what's in the light, what's out of the light, um, the big massiveness of it. I think it was the Clark Art Museum years ago. Uh, there was a Dutch etching show. So there were a lot of 17th century Dutch etchings. Uh, and there were, I think, maybe seven or eight Rembrandts. It, they were massive. They were a real powerful force. From that deep space, you saw this big, massive move. And that had a huge impact on me. I'm like, wow, that's the difference. I'm using also straight lines. You'll notice I'm not using any curves at all. If you look at Van Gogh's drawings, you, that's, they're so much about that looking for the large mass, but with straight lines. And I'm thinking about it from the outside in. Because the forms are so complex, you go from simple to complex, not complex to simple. I mean, you could, I'm actually not thinking about making a beautiful drawing right now. I think of them as like Fred Flintstone drawings, you know, like caveman drawings. Boom, boom, boom. You're just really trying to understand the structure. I'm kind of putting my emotional thing to the side. The graphite being really sharp is important because I can just make really precise lines. My students, when I'm doing these workshops, they always want to make beautiful drawings. Of course they do. Why wouldn't you? And I'm like, look, these ones you're going to do right now are not about making beautiful drawings. You're getting in there and you're figuring things out. I'm going to now go in from the outside and I'm going to come in. And the points on the outside, they actually have a relationship, an orientation. When you're outside with one of these points, you're actually, as you continue to draw them, you're relating to what's inside. So you're getting to know the flower via the exterior and the interior. So what I'm trying to do here is understand the form and then feel for it the best way I can so that when I go to paint it, I will have a sense of what I'm doing. And I always tell people that maybe this drawing will look good, maybe it won't, I don't know. <laughs>
Well, how do you deal with that? Because I know a lot of people get very frustrated very fast. I kind of give them the lowdown that you cannot do two things at once. You can learn or you can perform. But you can't learn and perform at the same time. A lot of people want to perform. If you think about it that way, you're going to be in a state of torture. because you, you can't do both. If I said, what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to learn. I want to get in there and understand it, right? If I was conscious of, ooh, I've got to make it a good drawing at the same time, that would not work. The real joy of what I'm doing is I'm spending time with my subject, getting to know it, feeling for it. It's always fun anyway. If I just focus on understanding and feeling for my subject, the process is, is about that. When I th start to think about light, I'll draw the shadow shapes and the light shapes. A third of this drawing is in the light, a third of this form, and two thirds are in the shadow. So it's a fair amount of shadow, which is interesting because that creates a certain kind of an emotional uh, feeling where you have most of the face is, is turned away from you, right? So that's, if that's figurative, that's significant. I'm calling the light and the shadow, even though there's a lot of middle tone in between. Once you start drawing and you're getting more and more elements into the drawing, you, then you start to see really cool geometric hookups. Something over here relating to something over here. Every line you make is sort of getting to know the form better. I'm always like amazed at how beautiful the structures are. It just gets deeper and deeper the further you go. And you have to have that attitude that you are enjoying what you're doing and you don't, don't want it to stop. I'm going to squint like crazy and I'm going to draw the biggest possible shadow shape that I see. I'm going to look for that large mass and I'm going to simplify it as much as I possibly can. Everything that happens on this side is in shadow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just wash in a tone of shadow very lightly. But what it will do is it will separate the rows into two halves. You're creating zones. Yeah. Simplifying a form is so hard. It's the hardest thing. People do. don't realize you really have to train your eye yeah. to see past all the details and all the fancy stuff. That's the whole difficulty of being, I mean, really doing real painting is that we want everything, right? It's like you get greedy, you want all that stuff. But the only way you could have it is to do it in stages that are simple enough that you can grasp. Uh, the more time I spend on this phase, the better my paintings end up. I'm having a walk in the woods, and I don't work to deadlines very well, as you can imagine. I'm Italian that way, too, like, don't rush me. This is my side that's in the light. This is my side that's in the shadow. And this is the formation of the shadow shape. It's this big, weird, kind of like semi-oval with spikes on it. You can't describe this kind of thing. When you get into a state where you're really looking at something, all your language just goes away. It's just, it's useless. When you're starting to deal with the contour, the overall three-dimensional look of that shape, every flower has its own very particular contour. And the more I paint these, the more I realize it's sort of, if you get that contour correct, it will feel like a very specific flower. If you don't, it will feel like a general, is nothing worse than a generalized flower. When I was a kid, I was one of those like super hypersensitive kids. I must have been a, I must have been a nightmare. I wouldn't throw pieces of paper away because I felt bad for them. <laughs> I know, it's insane. I love that. God, I feel bad for that poor piece of paper. You know, it's when you're approaching a subject like this, if you don't feel like inordinately tender toward it. Well, you have empathy for the rose. Super empathy, yeah. And I have empathy for the leaves and the, you know, you can see how you can go mad with that a little bit. It's useful in what I do. But now that I have a general sense of, you know, where the larger and the large mass is compared to the, to the smaller mass, I can go in and start building a little bit more deeply, which means I want to have a slightly softer lid. It's almost like you're exploring a cave. Totally. There's a whole universe in that exactly. form. A friend of mine says uh, that I want to be an insect. <laughs> so you could crawl around inside yeah. a rose? You want to be the bee. So the darkest spot is right in here. So this place right here is often like the focal point.
because those are the smallest forms. They're from the interior. They tend to be highly chromatic, very powerful color, and they are usually fairly dark, but there's not a lot of it. It's a very tiny little place. You're pretty conservative about how dark you get. Yeah, yeah. Real, I go very, very slow. You're not really painting what you see as much as you are painting what you feel. And the rose is a vehicle for you to be able to communicate that. I look at life as figurative. There's a figuration happening uh, and a narrative happening. And you told me that you think about the roses mm -hmm. as figures. I know. They're more like animals than they are like plants. They have different personalities. If you have one, it's a portrait. If you have two, it's a conversation. You know, and then if you have three or more, it's, it's like a, a party. <laughs> so I've always been on the side of kind of more the minor key. When I look at the flowers, I think I'm projecting something, obviously, from my own emotional experience. I've done a few happy paintings. I've got a few. But it doesn't feel true. I feel like there's a yearning that you want something, but you can't have it. Growing up in the church, Catholic Church, you are surrounded by imagery. I'm no longer Catholic. I think it got welded to the idea of looking and perceiving, yearning for something higher. How do you deal with the fact that these are not going to last maybe as long as the painting needs? It always starts from life. When they really are too far to paint from life, I use my iPad. It catches just enough to work from. So when our flower is gone, what I have is a essentially a magnifying glass. Now, the color is wrong. I mean, you can see it just, our eyes see so much more color. The only thing I really need is a reasonable reference, mm -hmm. mostly for structure. It gives me a general sense of, of what I'm looking at. I get my color from life. I don't get my color from the iPad. I've already got my palette set from life. So that's the difference with an iPad. The whole point is that you can zoom in. Mm -hmm. a, f a reference photo that's flat and static, that's kind of useless to me. It won't give me enough information. These little pieces of light, these little structural, that's really what the whole thing is constructed of. And then, then when you go to paint, you're dealing with mark making and movement, but you're really clear about what's going on with, with shape. If we look here, we can see the overlapping of those petals. You can start to really understand structurally how this thing opens up. Within the time frame that I have, I might not have the time to get this deep. If I look at it and I can feel something poetic happening with the light, then I know I have potential to paint it. Now, why did you make this big cardboard box? Yeah. Why does that matter? I'm trying to get the light to move in a certain way. Well, it's cutting off the light over here so that this is backlit. The light's coming in and there's a darkness back here. So this has a sort of glow to it. If I didn't have the box, I would have the light hitting and bouncing back from the wall. The roses I have are florist roses, so they're not ideal. They're a little bit stiff, but they're very beautiful shapes. The shapes have a, a very nice, delicate quality to them. As it is right now, it's a little bit flat. This shape up at the top is really beautiful. I like the way it cascades, but these are a little bit too similar in terms of value. I'm just going to touch it, and then I'm going to lower the light. This is kind of how I feel about what I'm seeing, rather than what I'm actually seeing, if that makes any sense. Right now, because I'm trying to compose with the light, what I'm seeing is not what the iPad is picking up right now. It's going to feel closer to what I'm feeling. I'm going to click on it and then just lower the contrast. That is more what I'm feeling when I look at this. When I go back to use my reference photo, I can remember that that was what I was thinking about. How do you define the role of those photos in the arc of your painting process? I found it's actually important because what I'll do is I'll work from life, I'll take a lot of shots on my iPad. It's a slower process of getting the painting to be fully resolved through different kinds of reference. I, I'll go home at night and look at my photographs I'll scroll through them and I'll look and I'll, I'll see, well, wait a minute, this one feels more potent to me. Well, why is that? There's a downtime in between having the experience of looking, the perceptual experience, and then making a painting. 
the making of a painting is a different experience than the experience of looking. What I've discovered that I do is that they're really quite separate. The subject needs time to kind of bake around the back of my brain, and I'm dissatisfied a lot. So I put up the painting and I look at it for, you know, a week or two weeks, and I finally figure out what I want. That talking back process can only really happen if you don't have the flower in front of you. I find it's actually better that they die. <laughs> you really need almost an incubation period mm -hmm. between the death of the rose and then the painting. Isn't that weird? When you're making a painting, you have to choose what is going to be the emotional content, right? Taking away of things is probably the most important part of painting. The, the downtime and the not having the flower in front of you, it helps me isolate the emotional response that I'm having, which is the thing that I want the painting to carry. If I had it in front of me the whole time, I would be tempted, I think, to sort of want everything. And if everything's important in your painting, nothing's important. Now I'm going to be coating the paper with charcoal to create a little even, relatively even thin scrim of charcoal. And then I kind of wipe it off in order to make a slightly more even surface. I want to have like a little field of space that I'm working out of. I'm thinking about form and light, but I'm also thinking about a real place that I can enter. What I'm going to do now is use the eraser, get that absolute first reaction. It's important to maintain the feeling that you have at the beginning, what hits you to begin with. You want to maintain that all the way through the drawing. That could be hard to do, so you need to have that you know, really clear in your mind before you begin. What I've determined is it's almost like a little bit of a triangular composition. The flower is at the top, and it's reaching. It's got like a reaching quality. This one is kind of moving down, and this one is fully at rest. The stem of this flower, as it comes across the picture plane, the table plane, is silhouetted. Very, very basic element of this whole idea is that this is the way that the light is going to work. So no matter what else I do, rendering form, making things more three-dimensional and so forth, that has to be the overarching feeling. Quite often it will, I'll work for half a day and not get anything. And then the next day, ooh, there it is. Now it's a matter of just continuing to think about where and how I want the eye to move. The reason that I go so slowly, I'm actually trying to inhabit all of this space. Well, I noticed that you're spending a lot of time focusing on the negative space. Yeah, because it's sort of the, all of the area around the form is, you know, that's, that's what holds things together. What I'm looking for is a way to navigate the space. Space is, it's the reason to, to make paintings for me. I mean, it's light and it's space. These little forms, they're just a smaller space. I mean, it's the same intention where you're trying to navigate through something spatially dimensional, it's just smaller. One of the reasons roses, as opposed to other flowers, are a bit more interesting is because they are spaces. So you're navigating kind of in and out of both of those worlds. I'm actually gonna take some vine and just get a little bit darker. Space is actually kind of this atomized experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like a flat. The air is what you're trying to paint. If I am not continually conscious of that, I'll flatten it out. The whole process, I'm going to use the toilet paper, high-tech tool, to knock back edges and kind of keep me conscious of the fact that I'm making a space. So you might think, well, why did you just rub that out? It's a kind of a matter of construction and then destruction all the way through the process. So I go back and forth, back and forth between defining something and then absolutely kind of taking it apart and defining it again. I feel like by wiping it away, it's almost like you're leaving a trace of the flower mm -hmm. and then you resurrect it. Exactly. I need to feel like I'm exploring some pla a place. When you're drawing, are you thinking rows to yourself or are you breaking it down into abstract shapes? Totally. I do an exercise with students, which is actually really helpful. 
So Fantin Latour composes so beautifully and, and will take a um, piece of acetate, put it on top and a Sharpie marker and just literally copy the shapes. And then I take it off and I put it on the wall and it looks like a map of Antarctica or something. It's absolutely, completely abstract. This is what people don't understand is they have the idea of a flower in their mind. The way the flower actually is given to you is these little shapes of color. I had a teacher who used to say, be the shape, Just be the shape. <laughs> it's hard for me because I wasn't trained two-dimensionally. I was trained to see three dimensions. I did a lot of sculpture. I did a lot of drawing that was three-dimensional. To flatten things out is really, really quite a challenge. When I was in graduate school, I taught myself landscape painting, and I was able to really study the Turner and Constable work at the British Museum. The space is just as important as the form. There's a mystery and a kind of discussion that goes on between the two. The vagueness of the space indicates a journey, like I'm trying to find my way through the space. And roses are not only forms, but they are spaces. There's stuff in here, you know? <laughs> it's like Those deep crevices. Yeah, there's, there's spaces in there, and when they turn, you can't quite see inside. You know, so it's like a mystery. Well, what's happening in there? What I'm noticing right now that I hadn't seen before, this negative shape in between becomes very potent and very important. What I don't want to do is draw everything that's up there. If I do that, then I will have ignored my emotional reaction. If I go ahead and draw the stem and the leaves and the background, and the, wh what I'm gonna be doing is taking away from the thing that I want. You don't ever wanna think that you're making a picture of a rose. That's like the kiss of death. You wanna think you're putting a mark of dark, a mark of light, specific shape here or there. Eventually, it will look like what you see, hopefully, if that's your goal. Are you thinking about composition much? Because I noticed that you don't do thumbnail sketches. So much of what happens happens in the process of drawing for me that I don't really know what I'm feeling until I get in there and start moving around. The idea of having a thumbnail would be that I knew, okay, this is what it's gonna look like. I mean, it would be great if it were that logical. I've done it, but it just doesn't really matter. I end up doing a drawing anyway that's somewhat chaotic. Some people really do need that reassurance. I totally do. <laughs> I could never work this spontaneously. Considering your process and the emotional response you're looking for, it totally makes sense. Pro I'm not that prolific, not because I don't work a lot, but because I don't keep a lot of what I do. Because I have to do images that aren't working to get the ones that are working. All of these little marks that are building up a space are also building up forms but they have to be sensitive in terms of edges and all of that stuff. It just has to be open. I won't really know what it's gonna be until I make you know, the last mark, really. The higher your standards are, the harder they are to meet. If you're always challenging yourself, which frankly you should be, in my opinion, then you're always going to be constantly in a state of continuing to learn new things. It's never comfortable, and you wouldn't want it to be. I mean, if it were like comfortable, it'd be boring. Then again, you know, people have different needs in, pain, in, in being creative. It, my need is to kind of go to this poetic place that I don't know yet. Some people need more of a consistent narrative, visual structure. But that's something you have to discover on your own. You don't know. You know, when you're a kid, you, you, don't, you don't know. So you just have to try this and that and the other, um, and you will find your own way through. So I'm not going to do this business over here very much. I think what I'm going to do is just a little, like a little hint of the structure of the stem as it's silhouetted by the light over here. If I get too involved over here, it's going to be too complicated. Uh, and I really do want to just kind of feel that relationship between the three blossoms. It's a good time to stop because I'm starting to say, well, this is really where I want things to be. They'll go in and out of phase in terms of their uh, light and dark contrast and edges and so forth, but at least I know that I want this here and this here. If I step back and I take a look at the whole and I can look at the still life and say, yeah, I think I have most of what I want. I might probably still fiddle with this a bit. I'm not totally happy with that. But it reads as a whole and it reads clearly in terms of that emotional thing that I had that I talked about at the beginning. And now it's just a matter of rendering and developing the forms 
so that they flesh out that emotional reaction. I'm noticing too, the marks that you make, they're fairly short and they're fairly small. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about structural questions. The shapes that are built here are quite small. I'd want to use straight lines. I don't want to use curved lines. I'm just really placing things. I'm not going to use line as line in this drawing. It's not going to be an expressive thing as it would be in a contour drawing. Uh, in fact, most of the line is going to disappear because it's a pictorial drawing. So when I go to paint, I won't be using line. I'll be using mass and tone. The subject matter dictates all of the stuff that you're going to end up doing. And in this case, these things are incredibly fragile and thin and airy. Thin charcoal, a little bit of atomized, dusty kind of stuff. That's getting me closer to what I am responding to. That wouldn't work for somebody else's content at all. It's not a preconceived idea, which makes it a little hard for a demo. So I usually tell people, look, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But if you want to really see what I do, this is the process. But don't you think that's necessary for people to see that you're not perfect all the time? Yeah, never perfect. At the beginning, when I first started teaching classes with this, I thought, oh my god, they're never going to get it. I better like do a demo demo. It just wasn't working. So I said, okay, you know, I'll just do what I really do. And I was surprised that pe people really wanted to see that. They, they wanted to see what I really do. And I just said, you know, hold on to your, <laughs> hold on to your seat. You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It might, it might not work. Do you ever feel as a teacher that you spend more time telling people what not to do as opposed to what to do? People have painted a lot. There, there's, there's a lot of pitfalls that they will fall into. You kind of know they're going to go there if you don't give them a heads up. But then again, they're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Which is like, I find the hardest part about teaching is being relaxed with the fact that students are going to have to make their own mistakes. It's okay, they'll, they'll find their way out of it. How does the Rose Encyclopedia help you with your paintings? It doesn't help me with my paintings as much as it just kind of gives me ideas of what I might want to grow. It's useful to look at because you realize that most people think of roses as a hybrid tea. They're like Franken roses. But if you look at the encyclopedia, you, you see the whole history and how things were hybridized and how the different strains were taken. And it's very creative, really. I'm actually going to a garden in Yorkshire in England. There's a garden that's attached to Castle Howard, and it's full of old roses. I mean, hundreds of varieties of real, the old ones, which it's just hard to find them in one concentration like that. I'm really excited about getting, kind of getting my face in front of these masses of, of old roses, because it's kind of where I'm going. So they were in the still life, they're kind of jumping out of the vases, now they're like crawling up the wall, and it's, to see them as they grow, I think I also want to um, begin to deal with the life cycle. Nature is just, you know, it's, it's endless, it's fascinating. So being in front of them, is becoming more and more important, and I don't think I'll ever have a garden like the one at Castle Howard. When we came into the studio today, um, it's a very different day. It's cloudy, so we have a much lower light level, which is very good, actually, for painting from life because you have a much more dramatic shadows. You don't have as much ambient bouncing light. So, And then I took my flowers out of the fridge, which you should have, if you're going to do flower painting, you have to have a fridge. One of them, the bottom, I had to cut off because it was sort of starting to droop. So I had to cut it off, which made it a bit shorter. So when I put that in, it changed the relationship a little bit. The one on the ground is, is more kind of dilapidated at this point, but it's actually kind of nicer. You seem to be happy that it worked mm -hmm. out for the better this time, but what mm -hmm. if you come in the next day and it looks worse? Mm -hmm. Since it does look better, I'm lucky, but if it did look worse, I have my reference photos on my iPad, which I would use. I think one of the things that you have to realize is that you're working with living creatures. Your take on it has to be flexible. In some ways, it's good to kind of challenge yourself to say, well, this is pretty good, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm going to see what happens if I work again. For me, and I think for a lot of people who paint from life, it's that experience of every day it's a little different, you're a little different, you know, uh, the light's a little different. You need to relax with that. Realize that you're not making a picture, that you're having an experience. So you may not end up even with a painting at the end of the day. You may end up with a drawing that's 
halfway there and maybe idea for painting. This is kind of like a lotus, this one. It opens up and it's got these little like fingers that sort of cup. Now when I'm looking at it, this like little bowl in here. Would you say you work big to small in terms of shapes or is it not that straightforward? From a distance, you want to have a feeling. And then when you get close, you're going to have these smaller things that you can enjoy. What I'm doing now is I'll go in and hang out in here for a while and then I'll be like, well, wait a minute, I do think I'm going to move that. I'll go in and out at this phase of the drawing and then eventually maybe I'll just be inside. You jump around the page a lot. Even though you are starting to get into some of those smaller spaces, you're moving up and down. Yeah. We're turning the paper into a place. You're always working the whole place. I am still trying to figure them out. They're endlessly interesting. They're like a, the human body where they, you know, you can always find new things to understand. Each one is different, so there's not even a continuity of anatomy. I feel like I'm spending time with them the way I would spend time with them in the garden. Commercially raised flowers are often, they're beautiful, but they're a little bit too perfect. Mm. They have these very thick stems so that they can be transported. They don't have a lot of flex, and if you look at garden roses, they have a beautiful rhythm. They're also completely different characters. Their forms and their colors are so specific and so delicate. You could never grow them commercially. These roses from the florist, you talked about them like Stepford Wives. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. The garden roses that you actually grow, they're another animal altogether. They're strange. They're not perfect. They have a lot more range. I'm not a rosarian. I don't even What's a claim to be. These, these are serious people. I mean, it's, it's, there's a whole language. There are people, that's what they do. They basically grow roses. They breed them. They have a whole life invested in what roses are, what they can be. The garden roses that are older, those are most interesting to me because they have personality. Uh, and if you look at hybrid teas, they're kind of predictable. But the garden roses that I grow and that I'm interested in are basically very unpredictable. And they're human-like in the way that they're subtle or loud or tiny or big. They have a big range of expressive possibility. I went back to the, to the rose and I did another structural drawing. And that is going to get me closer to when I paint. Some of these forms are quite complex, right? So... When I go to paint this, I really do want to understand how it's built. The danger of working too long on the setup drawing like this is that I can start to shatter it into pieces. This is actually not really a drawing drawing. It's not a drawing I would show. It's a drawing that gets me mentally closer to the subject and tells me what my initial response was. And so I'm going to like leave it. This is a drawing to help me isolate what I'm doing emotionally with light. So I can sense myself starting to futz around. I think of these as almost like architectural drawings with light, like the, the architecture of light. The word finish is, is tricky. If I try to close it down and finish it, it could feel like it's in a coffin. I think you always want the work to feel like it's evolving, like an ancient tapestry. They leave a thread that could be open. I don't want the experience of painting to be something that I already know. The more I do these, the more I feel like I'm just beginning to get what I want. It's like the carrot is just a little further away than it should be, you know, so you're always like chasing the next deeper experience. So sharpening, um, you have to have it at the right, whoops, the right length. Where's my little sponge? Oh, here it is, it's right oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, if I do this, see that? See the little bit of schmutz on there? Look oh my that. God. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs>